Presented by Caltech. We've been talking about the bandwidth theorem. I uh, did a little recap here of where we were last time. I, I think I said something last time, but uh, I didn't intend to say it when I said it. I think I wrote something like, when I was talking about what the text said, I think I wrote something like delta x, delta t. I don't remember what I did for sure, but I want to make sure that you're not confused by this. I said, I said that the text said something like this is of order 2 pi for a wave packet, such as the one up there. But I should have written either delta t, delta omega, or uh, delta k, delta x. Somehow I took the t and the x baby out of those and, and wrote it this way. So, so if you have this in your notes, cross it out. So in any event, um, cross it out too. Um, so we're in the process of thinking about how wide a wave packet can be. So for example, I have shown up there a wave packet as a function of t for some position x. I could do it also as a function of x for some type t. Uh, and do a very similar thing to what I'm doing here. Um, and that wave packet has uh, lots of frequencies in it. Uh, and so it will have some spread in time and some spread in frequencies. And I don't know what the bandwidth theorem relates these. Um, and so what I've done so far is I have defined what I mean by a spread in time. So delta t is just the RMS uh, deviation of the time in the wave packet. It's the mean square deviation from the mean of the time, which I can, which is the uh, you know delta t is the square root of the variance, and so I've written the variance under the assumption that I've defined t such that the average value of, of t for the wave packet is zero. So, so the wave packet is supposed to be somehow centered at time t equals zero as it moves away. I didn't have to do that, as I said before, but it just makes the, the formulas easier if I, if I do it that way and, and pick the coordinate system origin that's, that's convenient. Um, so the other, th so the part that we were just starting to work on was we have this expansion in a Fourier sine and cosine series here for the wave packet, written in terms of exponentials instead of explicitly cosines and sines. Um, but that's, this is an expansion for, for periodic functions with period t. So this is really uh, an expression for the amplitude as a function of time um, that repeats in time every interval, capital T. And I want to be able to consider the possibility that I just have a single pulse, a single waveform like that. Uh, and so I need to take some kind of a limit on this as my period goes to infinity. So there's really only one single period in the entire time domain. So that's the, uh, that's the mathematics I've embarked on here. Uh, so I have, uh, so I've written the amplitude as a function of time, and I've expressed these Fourier coefficients in terms of the amplitude using this orthogonality relation. So this is just like the Fourier sine and cosine series, except that I've done it with the exponential rotation instead of sines and cosines. And now I want to examine the period t goes to infinity and, and see how these equations look in that limit. So let's see. So I have, uh, I have a e to the 2 pi i n t over capital T. I want to take the limit as that time goes to infinity. 
let's define omega as 2 pi n over t. Okay, so t is going to go to infinity, but of course in the sum, n goes off to infinity too, so I can uh, imagine that I'll get some kind of uh, answer out of this. And I'm also going to express, I call this the inverse of that, okay? And let me make this a little more, the, the symmetry between psi of t and these a sub n's. So the a sub n's are now, uh, so they're functions of n. They're, de they're determined by n here. And so omega is also a function of n. So these a sub n's are going to really turn into something that's a function of frequency, of frequency omega. And so I'm going to write psi hat which is like psi, except it's a function of omega instead of a function of time. So psi of t is described in the amplitude of my wave packet as a function of time. This is going to describe the amplitude of my wave packet as a function of frequency. Okay. That's kind of what these a sub n's did for me in the case where I had the, the, the discrete uh, the, the periodic behavior. Uh, okay, so I'm going to define this to be t times a sub n, and for convention, I'm going to divide by a square root 2 pi. I don't have to, but I'm going to because I like that convention. So I have, so this is effectively rewriting the a sub n's in these two expressions. Okay, so then, I notice, first of all, that I can write d sub n is t over 2 pi times d omega. Uh, d n is uh, t over 2 pi times d omega. <laughs> I'm going to write psi of t as the limit as t goes to infinity of my sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity as an a sub n, which I'll rewrite, a to the 2 pi i n t over t. So let me use my uh, definition my uh, psi hat here and express a sub n in terms of psi hat. So limit of the sum of n minus infinity to infinity of square root of 2 pi over t times psi hat of omega e to the i omega t. So this is, they define omega to be um, 2 pi n over capital T, so that exponential, yeah. Um, what is the DN design? So I just took. I took this equation and wrote n equals uh, omega over 2 pi t, and then I took the derivative. Okay. The n, of course, in the sum is just 1. So we're always in incrementing n by 1. But uh, I, can, I can write an equation that I could have written a delta n and delta omega here, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> So this, um, square root of 2 pi over t, I can look up here at the expression I wrote here and rewrite this as 1 over square root of 2 pi times d omega by dn. And this is a no limit as capital T goes to infinity. So in the limit as capital T goes to infinity um, with, um, with d omega by dn being, being this, so in that limit, this is going to 0. dn is equal to 1. So that limit corresponds to d omega going to 0. 
So I'm taking the limit, and so I, if I, I could have written this as delta omega for delta n, but so delta n is one, delta omega goes, goes to an infinitesimal, which I call d omega. And so this sum is turning into an integral <coughs> in that limit. And so I get the limit, so I get a one over square root of two pi, two pi, times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of d omega, psi hat of omega, e to the i omega t. And likewise, psi hat of omega, that was, that's going to be the limit as t goes to infinity of whatever I defined it as. Uh, t a sub n over 2 pi, t over, it was, uh, what was it, square root of 2 pi, a sub n. <coughs> when I plug in what a sub n is from here, so the t cancels the 1 over t, and I get 1 over square root of 2 pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity, letting this go to infinity, in the limits here, okay, <coughs> times psi of t e to the minus i omega t dt. E and so what I've just done is use the Fourier sine and cosine series to go to this limit of a period of, uh, of an infinite period and what I've gotten out of it is something called the Fourier transform. So this is known as the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of psi of t is calculated like this, and we call it psi hat of omega. And the relation we have up there is the inverse Fourier transform. So we calculate psi of t as a function of psi hat of omega. So we've done this in a little bit of a hand wavy way, we're taking this limit, and you know, we haven't checked whether we're doing things in a mathematically proper and rigorous way. Uh, and it's quite a bit more work to actually do it properly. Uh, but, but this is the result that we get. Uh, and it is a very important result used in many places. The orthogonality relation. So this is our orthogonality relation. It shows that uh, the different n and m, these functions are orthogonal on this interval. Um, and this limit as t goes to infinity, it's 1 over 2 pi integral from minus infinity to infinity. And the point is, is that we if, we take, if we take the inverse Fourier transform of this Fourier transform, we get back to psi of t. So there's something, so there's an operation, it's the identity operation, if we do a Fourier transform and then do the inner inverse Fourier transform. And that's what the orthogonality relation expresses. So we get e to the i omega minus omega prime t dt. This is just equal to it's equal to the equivalent of this Kronecker delta except it's now some kind of integral transform that's, that's going on, some kind of integral operator. Um, 
And this is known as the Dirac delta function. It's the, it's the equivalent of the Kronecker delta in the limit where my indexes, n, n and m, are taken to be continuous. So omega and omega prime are just the n and m, but in the continuum limit, where they can take on any real value, as opposed to discrete integer values. And then the, uh, uh, the orthogonality relation reads like that, where The properties of this delta function are such that I take the integral of delta x over all x as just normalized to 1. And if I take and multiply f of x times delta x dx, and do that integral, I just get zero. So this you should think of as uh, the limit of a function that is very sharply peaked. So if I call this x, and this is delta x, it's very sharply peaked at x equals zero. In fact, infinitely sharply peaked. So you can take a function like a Gaussian and take its width going to zero with an area of one, uh, that would be a Bell's function. So it's a function that's zero everywhere except at x equals zero. And x equals zero is infinite. In such a way that its integral is equal to one. And I'm sorry, this is not zero, it's half evaluated zero. Okay, that's probably confusing people. So in other ways of expressing it, it's a linear functional. It's defined such that it takes some function f and evaluates it at zero. So you can play with those properties and, and see, uh, see how it works. Um, and at some point, you will discover, uh, if you play with it enough, you'll discover that it's not really a function. It's uh, something we call a functional, as I just said. It's a linear operator that operates on a function space. Just, uh, you know, this integral is not well defined. For one thing. So this is just a notation, if you like, that's, that's handy for how you use this. But if you try to uh, if you try to treat it as a linear integral, it's, it's not really correct. Uh, nevertheless, this this notation is extremely useful. To, uh, it's a nice way to write this operator, uh, and it can be made rigorous. So let's go back to our problem. Now, now that we've done this mathematics and seen the Fourier transform. <laughs> okay. So now I can define the variance of omega. So I define them. Um, the variance of, of time up there for my wave packet. Now I can define the variance of omega, since now I have a well-defined concept for what I mean by the amplitude as a function of frequency. So that's just going to be the variance of omega. With respect to this amplitude squared intensity in terms of omega. Uh, again, I'm shifted by origin and omega so that the average value of omega 
is equal to zero for my weight packet. Again, I don't really have to do this, but it just makes what I write down so much easier, so I'm going to do it. But if you don't like that, and, and you're not quite sure you believe it, you can try working it through without doing that. Okay, so let's see. So I'll have an expression for the variance of omega. I have an expression for the variance of a time. And I know from the discussion in the text that it's the product of uh, delta t times delta omega that I'm going to get some information about. And so that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm aiming for. Let's investigate. So we know what psi hat of omega is defined as. So let's plug that in here. It's the Fourier transform of psi of t. So we have, so we have to do a little bit of work. We go from minus infinity to infinity of omega squared times a bunch of stuff. So I have to plug in the integral over t. And I'm squaring an object, so I have to the integral over t over time. So I have to, I have to take I've got to take this and square it, okay? So I've got to be careful how I square it a little bit. So there's a 1 over square root of pi, there's a 1 over two pi, psi of t e to the minus i of omega t times complex conjugate, in case my amplitude happens to be complex, e to the i omega t prime. Take the, again, taking the complex conjugate up here, so I got a plus i there. Uh, and then this is all integrated over omega. What do I do? I'd love to be able to integrate by parts on my time variables. Um, but I have a little bit of trouble here. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I can do that. Okay. So let's integrate by parts. Um, how am I going to do that? Before I do that, I'd like to get rid of this omega squared somehow. Because if I didn't have this omega squared here, I could do the omega integral. Right? I don't want to do all the integrals, of course. I'm greedy. So I'd like to get rid of this omega squared so that I can do this integral over to the i omega t, uh, the i omega t prime. Of course, if I do that, what I have is e to the minus i omega t minus t prime, e to the minus i omega t minus t prime times omega is just like this relabeling things. And so that would give me a delta function of t and t prime, and that would do one of my t and t prime integrals. So let me, uh, let me think about this. I want to get rid of omega squared. down omega is by taking derivatives of these factors. Okay. So let's do that. So let's rewrite this as integral from minus. So I'm going to interchange the order of integration. Okay, let's do about 1 over 2 pi here that I'm going to use. Definition of the direct delta function. D omega, so I've got a psi of t. I'm going to take d by dt of e to the minus i omega t. And I'm going to take and multiply that by d by dt prime. 
of e to the i omega t prime times a sine star of t prime. Okay. You see, this brings down a minus i omega, and this brings down a plus i omega, and the product is just omega squared. So the equality is still working. Okay, let's see. Now, I'm going to integrate by parts. Now I'm going to do my integration by parts. Let's see. I will do this. Um, of course, it was awkward that I uh, turned my uh, my exponentials into derivatives. So uh, I've got to make use of that and then uh, get my exponentials back somehow. So anyway, by parts. T and T prime. And I'm going to assume that my wave packet doesn't go off to infinity. Okay? That it vanishes at infinity. That is, that sine of T goes to zero, or just sine T with open brackets, goes to zero as T goes to plus or minus infinity. So I need to assume that because the integrated part of this is going to look like a psi of t times e to the minor omega t, and I want that integrated part to vanish so I don't want to have trouble with it. So it's just a physical assumption that your physical situation is that the, that the amplitude is going to zero as, as for in the distant past and in the far future, the waves dissipating eventually. Okay, so then we get, doing that, we get, well, we're doing two integrations by parts, so the minus sign will cancel for doing that. Minus infinity to infinity, uh, dt, d psi of t by dt, um, because I've done the integration by parts, so now the derivative is acting on the, on the uh, amplitude. E t prime, d e psi star of t prime, by e t prime, times a one over two pi integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega, uh, e to the minus i omega t minus t prime. Now I'm getting somewhere. I know what this is. Just by relabeling the omegas and t's and changing their labeling, that's the direct delta function. This is just delta of t minus t prime. And so that means that I can, using this relation, I can immediately do one of these integrals. Okay. So all I do is when I do this integral, I replace t prime with t. Because this is zero unless t is equal to t prime. So set t prime equal to t, and I've done that integral. So this then becomes integral from minus infinity to infinity of d psi of t by dt, absolute squared, since this is complex conjugate, over dt. Okay, so now I have, I have an expression for delta omega that's reasonably simple looking. 
And I have an expression for delta t that's also reasonably simple looking. Let me multiply it. So therefore, what do we got? We got delta t, delta omega, I'll take the square. So that's equal to delta t, which is integral minus infinity to infinity of t squared psi of t squared dt times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of t psi of t by dt squared dt. Well, we still don't know quite what to do with that, I guess. Uh, but let's notice some things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume the integrals are finite and so forth. Okay? Again, that's basically, I'm, I'm assuming that the amplitude in its derivative will go to zero at some point at, at large times in the past or future. Um, <clears throat> So I want to think in terms of scalar products. Because what I want to do is I want to use the Schwartz equality. So let's think about this. So in finite dimensions, scalar product in a number of ways. So these are just notations. Physicists like to use that notation. Often you'll see uh, the notation e comma a, you might have seen that in math classes. Um, so a scalar product is a well-defined object that I think you've found the definition of in your uh, in your linear linear algebra or your linear spaces uh, classes. Um, so what is this? In finite dimensional space, uh, a typical, the, the, the most common scalar product that people use is just to sum over the components just sum over the components, a sub i and b sub i, the products of the components. And if, if it may be that you're working in a complex linear space, you have to remember to put a complex conjugate sign on the b's. And whatever the first uh, coordinate there is. It's the convention. Okay. And with that de definition, we satisfy all the properties of a scalar product. Uh, <coughs> We can take n goes to infinity. Nothing changes. I equals one to infinity. A sub i, b sub i star. So this is the same definition in an infinite dimensional vector space. But now what we're doing is we're going from these we're taking it a step further, and we're going from these discrete indices to our continuous indices omega. So I, I again go through another level of generalization to where this index is continuous. And so that goes the continuous index to an integral. So minus infinity to infinity, so that's the range of the index, a of t, so t is the index here, b star of t, 
IEG. And you can check that that also satisfies all the properties of definition of a, of a scalar product that we don't assume that we have a reasonably behaved space of functions. So these, so this is a scalar product in a function space now. A, and the, a is a function of T and B is a function of T. Um, so the, ve the vectors in the space are functions. Okay, and so then if I have a scalar product, I can define a norm, the norm of a vector. So I'll write a double bar for the norm of vector A. So that's just the square root of the scalar product of A with itself. And so that then is equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity of A squared A of T squared uh, DT with the square root sign. So in this vector space of functions, I have to find a norm according to this. So now let me use this notation that I've developed and this insight that I've developed on this equation. So delta t delta omega squared can be written as, well, it's the norm of something times the norm of something else. And so that's the norm of t psi t times the norm of d psi by dt. And these are squared. So that's the norm squared of this, and this is the norm squared of that, of d psi by dt. This is in a form now that Schwartz inequality applies. So remember, the Schwartz inequality says that if I'm in some vector space and I take the norm of vector A and multiply it times the norm of vector B, that that is at least as big as the absolute value of the scalar product of the two vectors. And we can quickly see how this, uh, how this works uh, by noticing that given any pair of vectors, in case you rusty on the short equality, we can find a vector P such that, and let me draw the picture first to make it clear what, we, what we're doing. So let's suppose vector B is pointing in this direction. Okay, and suppose vector A is pointing in this direction. So I have two vectors. In general, they define a plane. And they could be collinear and they just define a line. But generally, they define a plane, two vectors. That they define a plane. So the, so the blackboard is a plane of my two vectors. I can decompose A into a piece along B and a piece perpendicular to B, P for perpendicular. So the sum of P and whatever's here is going to be A. I can do that decomposition. That is, I write A is equal to the perpendicular component of A plus the component along B, where that component along B is just given by the scalar product of B with A divided by the scalar product of B with itself to get the normalization rate. And so this 
this piece is precisely this piece there. Okay, so I have so I have A is made on a this plus this that makes a triangle. I have Pythagoras Pythagorean theorem. And it says that A that the, the norm of A now squared is equal to the norm of P squared uh, plus the norm of B squared times that squared divided by, well, divided by PB squared. But this is just the norm of B to the fourth power. Get a product of B with itself squared, it's the norm of the fourth. And so this is that's an equality. If I drop out this non-negative part, I'll get an inequality. It's just equal to what's over there. Divided by B squared. And that's just the Schwartz inequality. Because that's the uh, Goes over there, this goes over there, take the square root of both sides, and I get the Schwartz equation. Good question? I, I'm sorry. Are you asking whether this is correct? And then I take a B squared and divide by B to the fourth, and I get B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've demonstrated Schwartz inequality. Maybe you didn't need me to do that, but I did. Um, and so now I can apply that. So I'll take delta T, delta omega. Uh, let me just eliminate these. Write it as the way I've been writing it, delta T, delta omega squared by the Schwartz inequality. So A is T psi of T, B is T psi by DT. So this is greater than or equal to the absolute value of this given product squared. I'm taking the scalar product here between those two vectors and squaring it. So I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting to where I want to be. Okay. But I have to do a little more manipulation. So the inequality is, is certainly true if I just take the real part of this. So let me do that. It's greater than or equal to just taking the real part of it, since that's going to be less than what I get if I take the whole thing. T psi of T. T psi star of T by dt times dt squared. Okay, and then I can rewrite this. Is that mine? Um, sorry. So 
So, okay, so I can just bring this inside and take the real part of so I of t, p sub star of t, dt, by dt squared. And I can rewrite this real part as just one half times psi d e psi star by dt plus psi star d e psi by dt. So just take that plus its complex conjugate and divide by a half dt squared. So these are all simple manipulations, but you have to kind of think about why you're doing it, and it will be clear in a moment why. Um, and so this is just so now I've got this written in a way that I can write this as a total derivative of of psi of d psi squared by dt, dt squared. And what I've accomplished now is I can now use integration by parts to do the input. So let's do that. integrate by parts. Assuming that t times psi, so this integrate, so this is what's going to be an integrated part, it's just t times psi of t squared. And so I want that to be such that that also vanishes as t goes to plus or minus infinity. I'll make sure that by whatever my amplitude is, it falls off fast enough at infinity so that I can ignore the integrated part. So, if we do this, we get that uh, I dropped a half up here, didn't I? This should be a one half. Sorry. So integral of, that. of just psi of t squared dt squared. But you remember, I think I've erased it now, but you remember we decided to normalize our amplitude such that this integral is 1. And so we're left with delta t, delta omega. So this, the spread in the time of our wave packet times the spread in the frequencies is bounded below by one half. And that is the bandwidth theorem. It's a very general result. We're just talking, we're just talking about an arbitrary wave pattern. So it could be, it could be any kind of wave. Could also, we could also show that delta k times delta x is greater than that half in the same way. If you did three dimensions, 
you would write delta k sub x times delta x is bigger than one half, delta ky, delta y, greater than one half, delta kz, delta z, greater than one half. So it works component by component in three dimensions. If you try to do something like take delta kx times delta y, there's no statement. It has to be kx with x, because these are what var variables that are related by the Fourier transform of each other. <laughs> so quantum mechanics is always that we express as waves. Uh, with, as we've mentioned on the homework set, momentum is related to the wave number by h bar, the place constant over 2 pi. And so we get, if we try to take delta p, again on one dimension, say, delta p times delta x, that's just h bar delta k times delta x. And we have our bandwidth here that says that's greater than two by half. So this is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And so we've just derived Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. With no extra work just because we know it's waves. Uh, if, for example, we have a pulse of length delta t equals one nanosecond, we could ask what the spread of frequencies has to be in that pulse. It's, it's bounded below by something, by our gamma theorem. So delta f is just delta omega over 2 pi. Uh, so that's greater than or equal to 1 half, 1 over 2 pi times 1 over delta t. And, and what's this equal to? That's equal to 1 over 4 pi, 10 to the ninth hertz. Now, uh, 4 pi is about 10. So this is about 100 megahertz. So if our pulse is what, if we have a pulse that's one nanosecond wide, we know it has to have frequencies at least up to 100 megahertz. So there's one last question I can ask. Uh, <coughs> We have an inequality. Can we find a pulse such that that's an equality? Can we ever achieve that bound with a physical pulse? So the Schwartz inequality is this. We got the inequality by throwing over the perpendicular component. But if there is no perpendicular component, then it's an equality. That is, if the two vectors are linearly related, then it's an equality. So let's try that. If and only if t psi and d by dt psi are linearly related. That is, d psi by dt 
is equal to some number of holiday A times T psi T. Okay, so if I can solve that differential equation, I'll have a solution that achieves the minimum bound. Okay, let's do, uh, okay, so this is D psi over psi is equal to A T D T. If I multiply through by dt and divide by psi. Uh, and then, so let's see, so I take the integral of both sides, so I get log of psi is equal to a t squared over 2 plus some integration constant. Let me write that integration constant as a log of some constant log of a. So these are easy integrals to do. Um, well, I did the integral, so now I just rewrite this, take, I'll take the exponential of both sides, and I get psi is equal to um, v e to the a t squared over 2. And for this to be physical, we must have the real part of a to be less than zero, otherwise it's just going to blow up with time. This is just a Gaussian. Gaussian is just something that comes with uh, multi Gaussian. Just, just your bell shaped curve. You have a Gaussian wave packet like that, then the lower bound of the bandwidth theorem is achieved. And, and, and in fact, I draw it in time, it's supposed to be a T there, it also looks like a Gaussian frequency. Four inch chance from every Gaussian is a Gaussian. Okay, uh, that's uh, a little bit over, uh, but that's it.